So hello and welcome. I'm Frederick Dunn and I want you to take a look at this honeybee swarm with me. What is going on? This time of year you might see swarms hanging from trees and in this case they're hanging from a maple branch. Low hanging honeybee swarm. Thousands of them. They left a hive. And here's the thing. We might have seen this before. We might see pictures. Maybe we saw movies of them before. And look at the surface activity here. They're clinging to this branch and there's a male drone right there and they're tooling all over the outside, but how many of you have ever seen inside a cluster of honeybees that are in their bivouac location on their way to a final destination and a new home? Probably not many of you. But in this video today, I'm gonna to take you inside. You're gonna see what the interior of a cluster of honeybees looks like, and you're also gonna hear what it's like to have honeybees all around you, above you, below you, next to you, in front of you. Let's go inside. So here we are, inside this cluster of bivouacking honeybees. And you can see they're feeding each other in the background, a little out of focus there. Where did these bees come from? Well, they came from one of my own beehives, to be honest. Then they flew out on July the 1st, which is pretty darn late in the year. They filled up on honey. And the resident queen flew out, and all of these workers flew with her, including a drone or two, which are the male bees. And then they temporarily bivouac. They hang onto a tree branch, as in this case, sometimes it's on the side of someone's house, a fence, maybe it's on a playground or somewhere else, but here's the thing. If you find a cluster of bees like this, even though it's impressive, there's thousands of them, and if you heard them flying in, that's an impressive and dramatic sound as well. But you know what? There's nothing to be afraid of. Because they're on the way to a new home, and when they do that, they're going to conserve their resources. One of their biggest resources, of course, are the bees themselves. Being that there's thousands of them here, they have taken on board honey and resources that they're going to need to start a brand new colony. So the queen's in here somewhere. It would have been fantastic if we come across her while we move the camera slowly through this bunch of bees. But I don't come across her. However, it's her pheromone that is keeping them all together. And they're clinging to one another. They're clinging to these leaves and the twig and the branch and the bodies of the bees that are several pounds are dangling from the bodies of other bees. And then at the top of that, you'll see that their little feet are hanging onto the branch or the twigs or the leaves. Now what we see on the inside is pretty interesting because they are gradually changing positions all the time. So some of the bees that are not burying the load of the others are shifting positions and taking their place over time. Now while they're in this cluster, some of the bees are flying away and coming back. If you listen closely, you can hear them. And when they're flying out, we have scouts that are looking for another location somewhere. They're looking for a cavity, one that's not already occupied by bees, and a suitable space. I'm told that their optimum space is 10 gallons. So that would be nice if it were vertical, if they could find a tree to move into. That's their natural habitat, a bee tree. And in the absence of that, we provide them with bee boxes and they're known as bee hives. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit too. But I wanted to get you inside so you can see closely what a honeybee looks like and what the activity is like inside a cluster of bivouacking honeybees on their way to a new home. Now, if you find a swarm of honeybees, what should you be doing about it? Well, for one, you shouldn't bother them. Don't poke them. Don't blow air on them. And uh, you could take a look at them, take a picture, but I highly recommend that you try to reach out to a beekeeper, let them know where the bees are located, how long they've been there, and how big it is, like size of a basketball maybe, soccer ball, softball, and so on. And if you can, take a picture from a safe distance. They're non-defensive when they're clustered like this. And that's because they're not defending a residence. They're not defending brood and they're not defending any resources that they have because the resources are only what they can carry on their bodies. And each of these workers can carry 30% of their body weight with them. 
So when they left the hive that they were occupying before, they took the existing queen with them. That means that in the old hive, they're making a new queen. In other words, she's probably already in a queen cell and will be emerging from that queen cell soon. By having the resident queen leave first, we can avoid conflict between queens because in most cases, honeybee colonies have only one laying queen. So they're kind of desperate. They uh, have to save the resources because when they find that new cavity to occupy, the workers that we're looking at here have to go in and begin to produce honeycomb. Honeycomb is beeswax. And when they produce the honeycomb, that means the queen that's with them can start laying eggs. Now when a queen lays an egg, we have to wait 21 days before that egg emerges as an adult bee. So for 21 days minimum, the thousands of bees that we see here are getting older, they're getting weaker, and they're dying off. Some of them are being captured and eaten by birds and other insects. So their challenges are very high. In fact, what's the percentage of swarms that actually finds a residence and survives to maturity and gets through a winter? It's about 14 to 17 percent, depending on where you live. So their chances are low unless you call a beekeeper to come collect them and put them in a hive. And what we're looking at here is just all the activity. You're listening to what's going on inside, but we get a chance to look at the anatomy of these bees pretty darn close. Look at the eyes that they have. They have large compound eyes. They have five eyes total. So you see two large compound eyes on the sides of their head, and then you see that they have three acella, or very simple eyes, in between those two. Those detect motion. But these are really marvels when it comes to insect design and behavior and all the things that they're capable of doing. And one of the most important things that people, of course, think about when it comes to honeybees is the fruits and vegetables and nuts and apples that are being uh, pollinated by these bees. And it might interest you to know that they're not native to the United States, that they were brought in. They were brought in by people. And when people brought them in hundreds of years ago, they were using them for beeswax to make their candles, and they were using the honey, of course, as a sweetener. They didn't even realize the extent of the pollination that they did. So now we know that we can expand agriculture based on the presence of the honeybee and its ability to pollinate the flowers and the plants that we value. So they're important to us and they're important to the world, let's be honest. Of course, in the United States, one of our largest pollinator dependent crops would be the almonds in California with roughly 80% of the world's almond market being provided by the state of California in the United States, they depend almost exclusively on honeybees for pollination. No bees, reduced pollination of almonds and others. Apple orchards, oranges, all of the other trees that require pollinators depend on pollinators like the honeybee. So we're looking at their hairy bodies, and you can see that really close right now, and there's something interesting about the hair on their bodies, and that is that when they fly through the air on a day when it's not raining, they generate a static charge. And when a honeybee lands on a flower that has pollen that's loose, it will attract on its own to the static charge on the hairs, and then the honeybee grooms the hairs of the pollen and pushes it back to her hind legs, which are called a corbicula, that's the spot on the hind legs where the pollen gets collected into a little ball. They need it to bring back to their hive to feed their brood. The adult bees need the nectar. The nectar is their carbohydrate. And of course they need to collect nectar and produce honey. And then honey is an energy resource that's going to get them through winter. So these bees in the month of July actually have an uphill climb because the whole time they're waiting for their new bees to emerge, they are losing their numbers. 
and then hopefully that's why um, they're producing all the resources inside their hive for reproduction of the colony for replacement workers but also so they can survive an extended winter which for here lasts just about six months so it's important maybe you want to support honeybees but you can't keep any it would be fantastic if you considered planting plants that are good nectar sources and pollen sources for honeybees where would you find out about that i highly recommend that you check out the Xerxes Society, or you can just Google pollinator friendly plants. And if you have a chance to maybe convert some of your yard over to clover and things like that, you could grow milkweed. Milkweed is blooming right now here in the Northeastern United States, and it is a fantastic nectar source for these bees. In fact, I can tell you ahead of time, foragers from this colony are already looking at the milkweed and coming back and it has milkweed on their legs so milkweed has a pollen that isn't great for the bees they can't really use it but i can see that they've been on the milkweed plants because the pollen is stuck to their feet and we of course have clover if you have a lawn and you don't want to do a lot of mowing clover is very easy to mow easier on your mower and better than grass because you're feeding pollinators. Let's just call it. If you can plant plants, or maybe you have a garden, and you like to have pollinators come to your garden, but you should think about things that flower for long periods of time, or maybe they flower during a period when other nectar resources are not existent. So the more diversity of forage that we have for our bees, the more we can guarantee them a resource of nectar and pollen throughout their productive year while it's warm enough and hopefully get them to build up their resources for winter. Now how long does a colony hang? How long does a swarm of bees stay on a tree branch or on the playground or hanging from your gutters on the side of your house or something like that? If you can't find a beekeeper, don't worry because it's a temporary location. They don't build their nests here in the northeastern United States in exposed locations. They fly off and find a cavity. So they should be leaving soon, but if you can get a hold of a beekeeper, please do. And remember that the reason that they're swarming is because we need more colonies of bees. If one colony of honeybees doesn't make it through winter and it dies out, then we would lose all of our bees if they didn't produce splits and swarms and start new colonies in other cavities that are available to the bees. And that's how they ensure their survival. And let's just face it, ensuring the survival of the honeybees definitely improves our available food sources for humankind everywhere. If you need to get one removed, remember, call a beekeeper, don't call pest control person, or please don't let someone spray them with insecticide. Give them every chance that we can. Now some people often ask, what uh, goes with the swarm? How do they decide which bees leave? when the queen is departing. Well, you know what? We see bees of all ages here. We see the very heavy haired, silver colored, light haired nurse bees that are very young. We see older foragers. You can get a sense of their age by looking at the edges of their wings and see if they're tattered and frayed and worn out because honeybees work themselves to death, really. And when honeybees are old and uh, they're dying out on their own, they tend to fly away from the hive and just die somewhere else. They face lots of challenges. There are lots of insects that eat the honeybees. There are birds that eat honeybees. And of course they face challenges when it comes to pesticides and insecticides that are used around properties or on gardens and plants and people want to protect their property from insects. I wish they would rethink that because when you're using pesticides and insecticides specifically, you could be killing off a bunch of beneficial insects like the honeybee. 
And the sounds that you're hearing, bees communicate through pheromone and vibration. So when bees want to communicate with one another with vibration, we're hearing, hearing that as a sound through our ears, but bees feel it through their bodies. So you'll often see bees grabbing one another and generating vibrations to motivate each other to go, to move around, and so on. Now, scouts have gone out and they're looking for a new place to live. When they come back, they join this cluster of bees and they do waggle dances on the surface of the cluster. They are trying to convince the rest of the bees in this bivouac location to go to the cavity that they've found. Now just one scout can't come back and provide that information and encourage the rest of the colony to move with them. They need several scouts to go with them. They walk off the interior spaces, they measure it, they check it for suitability, make sure that it can be sealed up, that they can be protected from weather in there, and that they can defend it. In other words, a small enough entrance that they don't feel exposed. Several scouts go out together, they find a suitable cavity, and then they come back and they have a consensus. This is very well described by Dr. Thomas Seeley, The Honeybee Democracy. So if you want to read more about bees and how their social structure is organized, that's a fantastic resource for you to read. So once they do that, they all come back and you'll see waggle dances going on the surface. If they don't find a suitable location, they'll hang here. The longer they hang on the tree branch, the fewer resources they're going to have. So it is important to try to take care of these bees if you can. So I hope that you've enjoyed looking into the interior activity of a cluster of bees on their way to a new home. And I hope that you'll think more about honeybees and the value that they have in our environment and about helping us produce and maintain more environmental diversity wherever you live. So as we pull out of this cluster of bees, we're going to go on and talk a little bit more about it. So we'll come to the outside here. And there they hang. It's later in the day now. It's getting darker. Rainstorms are coming. So you're probably wondering what happened to them. Well, here they are the next day, July the 2nd. And this is the same maple tree, but look, the bees are gone. Some of the branches are on the ground. What happened to them? I clipped it. I cut the branch right there. I took them to my pollinator habitat. And I put them in a butterfly net like this one. It's cotton. There's the branch. And then the bees went from this butterfly net and branch right into this hive, hive number one. And they moved in. And here are the bees taking possession of the hive. These are guard bees at the entrance, making sure that no one comes in 
except other residents of this colony. And there's one right there. They've already started foraging. So they're already bringing in resources. And it was interesting to me. Look at this cluster of bees on the front. They stayed out there all night. And look at this bee on the landing board waving its Nesanoff gland. They're trying to tell those up above that the opening is right down here at the entrance reducer. They communicate with pheromones. So once they spread that up there, maybe they'll get the message that the coast is clear and you can come down and join the rest of the bees inside along with the queen and become a part of their productive workforce. We don't see very many drones with this group. These are almost all female bees and here a few of them have decided, hey, something smells right down here. And we're gonna go down there and figure out what that is. And maybe even they'll go inside the hive. And they do. And then when they realize, through pheromone, that the queen is in here, they start fanning too, letting the others know that this is where the queen is. So they line up one behind the other and they daisy chain and fan the pheromone up to the bees that are clustered on the front. And then they're encouraged to follow that pheromone down and join the rest of the colony. It's a game of patience. None of these bees were shaken into this hive. They were all simply put in front of it. It's an empty 10 frame deep Langstroth hive. It has waxed foundation and one drawn comb inside. These bees are fanning their Nasanoff glands. And as I mentioned before, rainstorms are coming in. So it rained last night as well. So the bees that are clustered on the front of this hive are probably just trying to preserve themselves. It's in the 70s. You can hear the rain starting up again and they are gradually walking down. and they're all in. So I hope you enjoyed watching that from start to finish. Thanks for being here and I hope you look out for swarms and take care of them.